I am Sally Whipple. I'm Executive Director of Connecticut's Old State House, and I'd like, you to wel like to welcome you here today for one of our monthly conversations at noon. If you've been here before, you know that the conversations usually start with a look at history through the eyes of a historian who's done some new research or very interesting research, and then we follow up that historian's talk with a panel discussion, which brings the historical information into the present by applying new insights and information and discussion about current issues. These um, panel discussions are led by Diane Smith, who is Connecticut Network's senior producer for program development. She moderates the discussions with our wonderful panelists, and then she invites you into the discussion during a question and answer period. The programs are generously supported by Connecticut Humanities, so we thank them for this. And we also thank our friends who have partnered with us on this particular program. That would be the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame and the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. And I have to say that my first museum jobs were at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House and the Mark Twain House. And when I was working there in college, I fell in love with museums, but I also fell in love with Isabella Beecher Hooker. She was someone, if you had a group of tourists who were really bored on a tour, you could pull out Isabella and talk about the issues that she was interested in. You could talk about any of the Beechers, but Isabella really always sparked interest among people. And I know that you're all here today because she sparks your interest, and I'm really thrilled that we're going to have a conversation about her today at the Old State House. So with that, I'd like to welcome Diane and thank you again for all coming today. It's great to have everybody here. Um, as I was reading Susan's uh, just released book, Tempest Tossed, The Spirit of Isabella Beecher Hooker, um, I was looking at the wealth of photos that are in here and I thought, okay, well here is Isabella, the white-haired lady. I know you can't see her that way, but here she is, an activist at about a woman's activist at about the age of 80, okay? This is what 80 looks like today. <laughs> Gloria Steinem turning 80, still a woman's activist. At any rate, and probably with a straight line drawn between the two of them. Many of us have visited the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center and know at least a little something about the woman who wrote more than 30 books, most famously, of course, her anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. But Harriet was only one of the fabulous Beecher family siblings, which included brother Henry Ward Beecher, one of the 19th century's best-known ministers, and half-sister Catherine Beecher, whose writings influenced women's rights and education. Yet how many of us really know that much about Harriet's younger half-sister, Isabella Beecher Hooker? She was an ardent activist for women's right to vote, whose name really should be mentioned along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, two of the best known names in women's suffrage. With them, Isabella helped organize the National Woman Suffrage Association, and she fought for the passage of an 1877 Connecticut law that gave married women the same property rights as their husbands. But why has history left her somewhat behind? Well, it's an interesting story, and uh, we're going to find out about it today from our next uh, guest, who is our speaker of the day. She is Susan Campbell, and uh, many of you know her as the woman who uh, was writing a column for the Hartford Current for about 25 years. However, she is also now uh, part of the Partnership for Strong Communities as the Communications and Development Director. Um, but she did write that column for more than a quarter of a century at the Hartford Current, and her column about the shootings at the Lottery Headquarters in March 1998 was part of the Current's Pulitzer Prize winning coverage. And I should say she is part of the Robert C. Vance Endowed Chair in Journalism and Mass Communications at Central Connecticut University. Her previous book was Dating Jesus, a story of fundamentalism, feminism, and the American girl. She's the mother of two adult sons and the grandmother of seven. And in spite of the way that she may cuss like you wouldn't believe, she actually has a degree from Hartford Seminary. And so uh, a Hartford treasure and a woman I'm really proud to call my friend, Susan Campbell. I want every introduction to me to include my cursing. It is very fabulous. I have been practicing, practicing since the age of five, and it's good. But I will try and hold on, if, if, and if you think I'm going off on a tangent with a bad word in it, just raise your hand and I'll stop. Are you raising your hand? No, you're just, okay. 
Um, I come to you as a little sister, a little sister with two older brothers, both of whom are fabulous and very well known in Webb City, Missouri. If you haven't heard of them, I'm sorry for you. They were wonderful writers, great athletes. Everyone looked at Danny and Tommy, and then there was Susan. And I think that played into why I found Isabella Beecher Hooker so fascinating. When Diane talked about the fabulous Beechers, that's actually how they were referred, that family, the children of Lyman Beecher and a variety of wives, um, were fabulous. All the young men went into uh, theology. They were all ministers back when being a minister was probably one of the more influential jobs you could have. People would reprint your sermons and distribute them and read them like you might read People Weekly. If you had an honest bone in your body, you'd admit it. Um, ministers were the people people went to, more so than captains of industry and more so than, certainly more than politicians. Of the four daughters, one was studiously private. She chose a private life, which made her an odd, fabulous feature. That was Mary. And she married a, a Hartford lawyer, Thomas Perkins, and was content to serve as support for her fabulous family. Diane mentioned Catherine. I don't know what to say about Catherine. She was different. Are there any Beechers in the house? <laughs> we can speak freely. Excellent. I didn't like Catherine Beecher, and here's why. She walked both sides of the street. On the one hand, she was this incredible advocate for women's education. On the other hand, she feared that if women got the vote, then that would sully their moral compasses and they would no longer serve their purpose, which was to raise wonderful American men who would then take over and run the country. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I don't agree with that, and I had a hard time reading some of her letters. So did her family members. Um, then there was Harriet Beecher Stowe. Perhaps you've heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It would advise with the Bible as the most um, unread popular book <laughs> of, of ever, of ever. It still is. And, and actually, uh, the Stowe Center, and there's a line right there, so say hi to everyone there. And the hi. Um, they just completed a marathon reading of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it was incredible. The words still speak to us. And then there was Isabella who was the daughter of Lyman's second wife. She was the half-sister of the more illustrious Beechers. And her older sisters worried for her. They basically served as her mother. Her own mother, Harriet Porter Beecher, and it gets very confusing, everyone's a Harriet, um, died when she was just 13. And the family was living out in Ohio at the time, and there are letters back and forth between the older sisters saying, we're very concerned for Isabella's soul. These were all preacher's kids, PKs. Um, she's frivolous. She worries about her hair. She worries about fashion. And she's a Beecher. She needs to be serious. What do we do with her? So they decided they would ship her off to Hartford, far away Hartford. Now, the family had started in Litchfield. Actually, Lyman was born in Guilford, but the family had started in Litchfield. Mary was in Hartford. So they decided, we'll send Isabella to, to Mary and Thomas, who were happy to receive her, and maybe she can get a little more serious. So she started life with her siblings thinking she was frivolous. And if you've ever been a little sister, you never get out from underneath that. Your older brothers and sisters will always think you're just a little frivolous. I know. I speak from experience. So she comes to Hartford. And at the time, the country was roiling with the slavery question. And there were abolitionists, but there were gradations of abolitionists. You could believe that slavery, slavery was wrong, but that you should free the people who had been enslaved, and then send them to Africa. And I won't say back to Africa, because some of them, their families had been here for generations. They had everything to do with Africa that I do. So those were the colonizers. And if you did read Uncle Tom's Cabin, in the end, Harriet belongs to that troop. And then there were the whole-souled abolitionists, such as the law clerk who was working for Thomas Perkins at the time, John Hooker, of the Thomas Hooker family. He was a whole-souled abolitionist. He believed that people who had been enslaved should be freed, and they should be given all the rights of American citizens, including the right to vote and the right to own property. And he, he took one look at Isabella, and he dropped hard. He loved her. And he started talking to her about maybe having a future together. Isabella had seen her, her siblings' marriages up close, and she said, no, thank you. I don't think marriage is for me. I, I don't want to become an appendage. And she could see her sister Catherine 
difficult though she might have been, having her own career. And that's what Isabella saw for herself. She knew she had the intellectual chops. She'd sat around the table and the parlor and argued, but she didn't like abolitionists. They were crude. She'd watched her father go through a difficult uh, series of debates in his Ohio seminary where he, he was the president. And uh, he was more of a colonizer, and his students parted with him. And it, it upset him greatly. And all she knew was that abolitionists had hurt her father. So when John Hooker started to talk to her about abolition, she really wanted nothing to do with it. But he was persistent, not only in his politics, but in his expression of love. Let's get married. No, thank you. Let's get married. We should get married. We'll be an intellectual equals. It won't be a marriage like you've seen. Let's get married. No, thank you. And he finally did what I did to my husband, which was he wore her down to a nub. <laughs> Until finally she said, fine, let's be engaged for two years, and if something better comes along, take it. <laughs> Seriously, no harm. And actually, legally, if a young woman's engagement ended, she was then marked a bad woman, a whore, let's say it. And CTN. Um, so she was making a pretty big commitment. If something comes along that you deem more suitable, or if I change my mind, the engagement's over. That's done. And then these letters started back and forth. And if I thought I liked Isabella when I originally started looking into her life, I loved her at the end of the letters. The Beechers were prodigious letter writers. And I've said this before, but when you read the Beecher letters, it's like reading this incredible script of incredibly smart people. Catherine would write Harriet, would write Thomas, would write Henry Ward, would write Isabella. And the writing was all over the page and very spidery and hard to read, but once you broke the code, oh my gosh, I wish I was smart like them. It was great. So they're writing letters back and forth, and she finally wrote to her soon-to-be husband and said, fine, August 1841, let's get married. The family's going to be together anyway. Which <laughs> isn't a ringing endorsement. And they got married. And it was a meeting of equals. And John Hooker kept feeding her things to read until she finally became a whole-souled abolitionist to the point that when Harriet had her great success with Uncle Tom's Cabin, there were a few little snotty letters that Isabella wrote John, like, I'm really glad she finally saw the light. Would that she was whole-souled. And she also wrote a letter to John, and that's what iced it for me. That's what, why she became my 11-year obsession she wrote, she moved into Harriet's house to help her answer the mail, and she wrote her husband, John, I see my own smallness when I see her greatness. I'm paraphrasing. But my own smallness, I see it around me all the time. I'm a beecher. What am I doing? I'm married. John had hurt his eyes when he was at Yale studying, and so she would read Blackstone's commentary to him at night, and he would read the current to her in the morning. So you would have the heavy reading at night, and the light reading in the morning. I say that with all love. And she came across the part that talked about what happens to a woman once she gets married. That marriage contract is the last contract she'll ever sign. And she sunk into a depression. It's exactly what she feared. But I'm a Beecher. I'm not Isabella Hooker. I'm Isabella Beecher Hooker. And she had to fight off that. And, and she started reading more about abolition and and. Like many of the early suffragists, she started to see the connection. If we free the people who had been enslaved, give them the right to vote and to own property, what about the women? What happens to the women? And what they were told by some of the organizers, and this was the phrase, it is the Negro's hour. We're going to pay attention to ending slavery, and then we'll get to you. Sixty years later. Okay. And that ignited her. And she started writing letters to, to authors at the time. And she wrote letters and, and introduced herself to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a little taken aback because she was a Beecher and she would offer to write her speeches. And finally, Elizabeth Cady Stanton saw what kind of writer she was, and she would send her her speeches to be edited. And, and she started drawing, along with Susan B. Anthony, she started drawing Isabella into the movement. And Isabella took to it like duck to water. She had been waiting for this. I also like her because she was not always polished. She one time wrote Elizabeth Cady Stanton that she looked forward to her coming to Hartford, but it was okay if she didn't because that would give Isabella more time on stage. But if Elizabeth wanted to go in and send her money, that would be great. <laughs> I like that. 
that's the kind of woman I could get next to. She kept pushing, and, and Diane mentioned it. In 1870, she and John wrote a law that they begin to petition the legislator, legislature that would allow women to own property in Connecticut. Unheard of. It took them seven years. Every year they would go back. And finally, in 1877, the governor signed it. And it was huge. And she just kept pushing. And the more I got to know her, the more I saw the theme of her life was no matter public censor, no matter what people thought of her, the cute Beecher, the frivolous Beecher. I just need to mention she also aligned herself with <laughs> Victoria Woodhull. Have you heard of her? What a fabulous woman. She ran for president in 1876. She was a wonderful speaker. She was charismatic. She was a stockbroker. She may have had sex outside of marriage a lot. Um, <laughs> She believed in free love, which was the notion that marriage is bondage and you are free to love whomever you love. And she believed that Isabella's older half-brother, Henry Ward Beecher, a minister, also believed in free love and that he should be less hypocritical and talk about it from his pulpit. And she had the goods on him. And so it was Monica Lewinsky on crack. She published a story. She was also a newspaper editor. She published a story about Henry Ward's indiscretions. And this was not news to people. Most people would say every Sunday when Henry Ward gives his sermon, he's speaking to no less than a dozen of his mistresses. But one talked. The Beechers pulled in the wagons and, and ringed around Henry Ward and said, he's a man of God. He would never do that. And Isabella, who had become friends with Victoria Woodhull, said, yeah, he did that and he needs to repent. And I'll preach at his church while he gets right with God. The Beechers were furious, particularly her sisters, who were very much, very close to Henry Ward. Harriet was probably the one most angry, because you're a Beecher. You side with Beechers. This is a public disgrace. You cannot say that your brother, in fact, strayed from his marital vows. I invite you to look up Eunice Beecher. Being that way is no excuse for someone to stray from the marital vows, but boy. <laughs> so there's Isabella standing by herself with her husband, John, who's written an autobiography, and I invite any historian in the room to write a biography of John Hooker. What a fascinating man. He was a feminist. He was ab an abolitionist. He was an abolitionist before it was cool. Um, and he's standing with her, and at one point he's going to take a trip, and he writes a letter to his wife and said, if I don't make it back alive... They thought like that. Don't you dare side with Henry Ward. You know he did it. He did it. And so she stood firm. Her family, in a reaction to her not standing with the family, began to circulate stories that she had lost her mind. All of the Beechers at some point, I shouldn't say all of them, many of the Beechers at some point suffered from dementia as they got older. But they hit Isabella hard with that. And she also was a spiritualist. She believed that the veil that separated the living and the dead was fairly thin and that you could talk to the dead. If you consider that so many people that in that time and in that place dabbled in spiritualism, including Abraham Lincoln, that wasn't that unusual, but Isabella never dabbled. She went whole hog. Um, there was a story of her having a seance in her home, which is still in Hartford, um, not far from the Stowe Center. And she had a seance upstairs for a New Year's Eve party. Her fabulous neighbors were downstairs, including Mark Twain and his wife. And she came running down the stairs holding a tomahawk because she believed that she was channeling an Indian chief. And Mark Twain looked at Livy and said, we got to go. <laughs> this is weird. And he would know. But he, too, dabbled in spiritualism. His wife was healed by a spiritualist when she was a teenager. But dabbling was okay. It was, I think I've said this, too. It was sort of like if you're running as a Christian and you are a politician. It's okay. Just don't fly the flag really high. She couldn't help it. If she believed spiritualism, spiritualism was the way to go. Everyone needed to know about this. So she got older, and like so many of the, the suffragists, she never got to vote. I often hope that Susan B. Anthony is buying the next round for Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Isabella Beecher Hooker and Lucretia Mott and all the other, the, all the other people, the Grimke sisters, who never got to vote. They died before him, but they laid the foundation. And we know how history teaches, treats people. We know that we like to uh, talk about generals and presidents and, and men, and they're awesome, and that's great. But what often gets left off the page gets pushed push, pushed off the page, that's a hard word, are the people who laid the foundation. 
We know about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we don't know as much as we should. We know about Susan B. Anthony, we don't know as much as we should. My goal in writing this book, other than to get the obsession out, is that we know about women like Isabella Beecher Hooker because we really should. She worked hard. She formed women's clubs in Connecticut, and when she found that women were a little hesitant to come to those, she formed pol political science clubs where women who had been taught that the woman's sphere is in the home, keep your hand on the cradle, stay out of the real world, would get to know what are the politics of the day and how do they affect you. She did all these things, not because anyone was telling her to do it, because, but because they were right. Because she knew that a country that only relied on 49, 50% of its population was not going to move forward. She envisioned a country run strictly by women. And her being a beecher and her being middle-aged at the time, she thought middle-aged women whose children had left, left the nest would be most suited. They'd have the most time. I like that too. I would like to run the country. I'm a middle-aged woman, and my children have left the nest, and I can push the grandbabies off my lap quicker than anything. Just let me run the country. She was that kind of woman. Put me in. Let me have an impact. And then she died. And the Hartford Current, in her obituary, said that she suffered from an agony of personality. That does not sound positive to me, does it? <laughs> And if they say in my obituary at the Hartford Current that I suffered from an agony of personality, I will prove that spiritualism is alive, <laughs> and so am I. And I will take whatever editor is there at the time and throw him or her off the roof. <laughs> I would encourage you to listen to the conversation. There are wonderful women going to talk. And, 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 and also, when you go home, think about people in your own family. Everybody got here on the back of somebody else. And we all have family members who did a lot. And they're not in the history books, but maybe they should be. That's it. Thank you. Susan, are you taking the Victoria Woodhill uh, approach and just declaring your candidacy without a party affiliation or any kind of background? Or <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm as good a speaker as she was. She had a way of casting us. There's probably people in the room who know more about her than I do. But she had a way of casting a spell on a group that I don't possess. But if I did, I would use it. <laughs> Yes. I want to introduce you now to uh, the rest of our panel. Shannon Burke is the Director of Education and Visitor Services at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. And Teresa Younger is the Executive Director of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, also known as PCSW. Um, I would encourage you, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We are taping this for CTN, so this is a television broadcast. So we need, if you have a question, to get a microphone to you so that you'll be recorded. So we've got somebody right in the back with a microphone, and and uh, you can just raise your hand and we'll try to get to you. So if you don't mind, that'd be great. Um, Susan, you mentioned that Isabella forged ahead despite public censure. And I wondered about how long it took for the women who were suffragists to fight the tides, to get the vote. It went on and on and on. And as you said, the ones who really laid the foundation never got to vote. Would activists today work as long and as hard for a mission? I hope so. I think what happened with getting the vote is it was a wave, and you help me if I'm wrong, that it was a wave that one generation would fade away and the next one would step in. And I think every one of those women suffered public censor on some part. The quickest way to dismiss a woman is to make her a sexual suspect. And many of them were accused of being sluts. And, and nothing could have been further from the truth. They, they were dedicated family women, and yet they were pushing for rights that were considered to be strictly in the realm of manhood, so something must be wrong with them. Mm. Teresa, are there um, attributes of Isabella Beecher Hooker that are common uh, with activists today? Well, I, I think so. I mean, what I uh, was learning about her, what I think is most interesting is she was a self-learner. 
She filled her time with making sure she understood what the history was, even the history of that time. And I think activists today spend a lot of time understanding and appreciating their history. Much of what you said, Susan, was so right on the money. We talk about standing on the shoulders of the women who came before us or those who paved the walking on the path of those who paved the way. And that's what activists have always done. We've understood that you can't just, um, you can't just plant a tree and have it grow. You have to water it. You have to understand that certain trees grow in certain areas, and sometimes you have to change the pH balance in the, in the dirt to make sure that, that it can grow effectively. And I think what's, what's happened over time is that uh, women activists uh, understand that change needs to happen. They understand that sometimes the debate needs to happen in a more formal way. And so they line up all the data so that they don't get marginalized in the conversation. And I think that's very much what Isabella did, was made sure that she had all the facts in order uh, so that, well, you might want to marginalize her. You really couldn't because she was very, very bright and really dug in and understood why she had the point of view that she had. And, and, and it was a, a good conversation point to assume that women knew what they were talking about. Shannon, um, you're a little bit of our bridge between yesterday and today, uh, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, would you talk a little bit about um, how the Stowe Center connects us to the past and keeps the history alive for us today? Draws yeah. those comparisons. I think that uh, many people today are, would be surprised about the similarities between Isabella, activists um, from her time, and the women today who are, are continuing on with the fight. How many of those issues that were um, relevant then are still ones that persist with us today, still ones that need attention. And so at the Stowe Center, we try to make those connections. Um, and present uh, uh, programs that deal with those issues, um, and, and that explore the history of them, the women who went before, who um, were working on those issues, and identify ways for us today to get involved to help create that change. And again, that there is, are still a lot of similarities between the issues we were fighting for then and the ones that still persist today. Susan, you mentioned that um, Isabella became an 11-year obsession for you, to the point where I think um, some people would go like this when you came by and started to mention her name. <laughs> they did. Um, but you actually um, contacted a medium. Yes. And tell us what happened. I did. And, and this is, of course, because of Isabella's spiritualism right. and the fact that she believed you could talk to the dead. And I don't disbelieve that, but I'm not a card-carrying spiritualist. But I had written the book once and turned it in and was talking to the editor and did the stupidest thing imaginable. I said, gee, I wish I was doing this again. I would make it more lively. I think it's too, I don't think I captured her spirit and I'm still not sure that I have. So the editor said, well, take it back and write it again. So, oh, sure, yeah, that's a great idea. I wish I had kept my mouth shut. So part of my research the second time around, this is when you're really obsessed, is I contacted a medium. I didn't tell her who I wanted to talk to. I just said, I'm looking for someone. She was of this era, and I would love to see if I could contact her. And I still don't know if I did, but I will say that some of the things that the medium was saying that the woman I contacted was saying, uh, she said at one point that she liked my president. And I said, Barack Obama? Thinking, how do you know? OK. And she said, yes, and I like your first lady. But much as it was in my day, uh, the woman gets the cause and the man gets the country. Who cares about fat kids? I'm like, <laughs> oh, I have, I'm not going to correct you. I'm, you're dead. But that, it was just sort of this conversational, OK, you would probably say something like that. I, I don't know that I would have phrased it like that. But um, OK, so I, yeah. I did. I c contacted a medium. And the weird thing, one of the weird things, was at the <coughs> end, the medium said, well, she's always with you if you ever want to talk to her. I'm like, I don't know if I want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So yes, it was an obsession. I encourage you all to have one. It makes you uh, a bane of everyone's existence. <laughs> Shannon, spiritualism um, really did have a, a, a very strong revival at that point. There were a lot of people interested in it. Susan mentioned Abe Lincoln dabbled with it a little bit, but it wasn't that uncommon. And yet, Isabella was thought to be weird because she did this. Right, sure. So um, it, it was it was very common, and it was you know a time when people were looking for explanations and how to you know um, under, better understand what happens after people passed on. Um, Stowe herself um, 
uh, participated in, in seances, sought the advice of mediums. It was, it was a common thing for people to do then to understand. And I think it was just yet another way that they were trying to marginalize Isabella by making it seem different and calling attention to the stories like the one Susan shared with, with uh, Twain and, and his wife at the seance. And you know, um, that's one incident of many. <laughs> um, but those were the ones that got highlighted and, and you know, told over and over again. And Susan, she seemed um, to get more involved with it as more of the people that were close to her and that she loved died. It seemed as though she did not want to break the connection. She felt the connection continued. Very much. It, it's, it, it started fairly young. But at one point, during all the hullabaloo about Henry Ward's infidelity, she was in Europe and had gone there to escape, not knowing that all the front pages of the European papers were carrying stories about this event. And she had a vision of her mother who uh, came to her. And basically, her mother had been sickly, so she wasn't on task a lot. But she gave her advice as a mother would. And then also, because she was a beecher, shared some advice on, on how to do housework better. So <laughs> that was helpful. Um, coming back from the grave for that seems a lot of effort. But we have stain removers now. We don't have to worry about that. But I, and she lost her older daughter, her much beloved older daughter. So yes, as, as she lost people, when John died, her journals are full of conversations or conversations she wanted to have with him and hoped that he would return to have. Teresa, um, I think that women like this um, are an inspiration if we bother to pay attention to them. Is there something that we should be getting from Isabella and Harriet's life that we can bring forward today that's still relevant? Well, I think what people forget is we're always looking for a spectacular mm -hmm. in people who lead or who, in people we want to follow or accomplish. The reality is women have notoriously and continue to be leaders in their homes. They have continued to figure out how to make change happen, how to get people to the table and host a conversation, how to resolve a problem. And I think that is exactly what we need to do. We need to not look so far out there um, and really look in our own backyards, look in our own families. What was an exception to the Beecher family was there was greatness all around them all of the time. But the reality is most of us have a mother or a grandmother or an aunt who challenged us, questioned, wasn't quite the, you know, prim and proper person in the family. And the reality is we probably all have those. They're close by. And we need to recognize those women in our lives for what they do for us, how they've paved the way, and how they inspire us. Shannon, what Teresa said about um, starting a conversation, even if it's around your, your own table in the kitchen, uh, reminds me very much of you know, civic engagement and what it's supposed to be about. It doesn't necessarily mean running for office. Right, exactly. And I think that you know, that cult of domesticity, the um, opportunity that women of the 19th century had to find a voice outside of their home or to, to give voice to their issues is, is, is really, um, you know, again, connected to that idea of, of uh, women, the power of women, you know, whether as a, as a daughter, a wife, a mother, um, but that idea that it was, they had that moral superiority and that um, obligation um, to other women to be civically engaged, to get out there and speak for things, and that many of them, not just for their, their gender, but for their own personhood, that they wanted to have equal rights, um, not to really um, call attention to their rights as women, but that they wanted to be treated as equals. We have a question over here, if we can get the microphone over here, please. Hi, fascinating talk. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about how Isabella fit into uh, the, her time, particularly the, uh, the, the 1890s, early uh, 20th century. Um, you've uh, stressed how much she uh, associated with uh, more radical women, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Susan B. Anthony. What about more conservative women? I'm thinking particularly of her role on the Board of Ladies Visitors at the uh, Chicago um, World's Fair in the early uh, 1890s. I mean, that board was largely made up of wives of corporate uh, leaders. I'm just wondering how she got along with them. And is it, does, does she uh, fit in well with the, that, that sort of that group of activist women? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> they were, uh, the, the, the Board of Lady Managers was headed uh, by a conservative Southern woman who had 
a stranglehold on the funds. And at one point, Isabella thought that the funds had gone awry. And as with her brother, she grew fangs and a hairy back. She did so, though, very judiciously. She was diplomatic. And I will say, of all the women you could name in the panoply, she was very good at bridging the gap. At, at getting conservative, more conservative suffragists to talk to the more radical suffragists, but she aligned herself very much with the radical suffragists. And in the 1890s and the early 1900s, she was getting older, so she accepted her role as mother of the movement, one of them, and she would bring young women to her mansion and teach them how to organize. She never quit until she died. Susan, it struck me that uh, very much that uh, a person is not necessarily born an activist, even if you are born a beecher, uh, because she starts out trying to be the best mother she can be and, and uh, accepting her life at home, or at least telling herself and her husband that she's accepting her life at home and doesn't yearn for the fame and the, and the glory that her sisters have. And yet, as the decades go by, that changes. And it seems as though it changes all of a sudden very quickly. She sort of eases a toe in, and then all of a sudden, she's, she's in. out there. Yeah, she really did try. She wrote mother journals from the moment she had a child, and they're boring. It's a lot about every word they said, I'm sorry, Stowe Center. They're boring, right, Beth? <laughs> boring. How to choose muslin, curtains, boring. Um, but then there were, she kept edging toward, this is not necessarily what I want to be doing the rest of my life. And I know I have an intellect, and I know I have a brain. But yeah, she dipped a toe in. I think. For most activists, it takes a little bit of arrogance in that you notice an issue and you say, I can fix this, or, or I need to wade in. I need to be a part of the solution here. And, and she, def she was a beacher. I can fix this. So once she was in, she was all in. Shannon, I think for people that um, don't really know that much about the Beechers, they probably don't realize just how famous these people were. I mean, we're, I think Susan said, we're talking the Kennedys multiplied. Right, right, yeah. This was a family that had a lot of influence, and um, they were raised from the time they were very young to believe that they had a role in shaping the country. Um, they, were, they were told they had to do great things, and so that um, each of them went out in their own way to um, advocate for... Um, uh, issues they believed in, or all the boys became ministers, and um, the women, as, as Susan mentioned, Catherine becomes a, um, an activist for um, women's education, and then, of course, Harriet, who um, really uh, speaks out against the um, injustices of slavery when she writes Uncle Tom's Cabin. Connected to um, the, the, the biggest horror she sees is the damage it does to the family, tearing the family apart, literally tearing the, uh, the child from the woman's arms on the auction block. And then, of course, um, Isabella finds her issue really for um, advocating for um, suffrage. Uh, you, Susan, recount the episode where, uh, it's, uh, and you say this may be apocryphal, where Lincoln meets Harriet, and I didn't yeah. never realize that Isabella was along with her. Yeah. Uh, but people talk about this all the time. I've quoted it myself, and it may not even be true. Tell, it's a tell great story. <laughs> By all means, it's uh, yeah, not yes. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad. Tell a good story. It's a great story. By all means, tell everybody that at one point after the Emancipation Proclamation and the huge influence that Uncle Tom's Cabin had, uh, Harriet was in Washington accompanied by Isabella, and they met Abraham Lincoln. The letters home said, well, the letters home made fun of him for being a country bumpkin and said he didn't act like he knew who he was talking to. But the story that sprang from that was that he was to have leaned down, taken Harriet's hand, and said something like, so you're the little lady who started this big war. Much better story. <laughs> Probably didn't happen. Much but better. tell everyone you know, because that's way better than he was a country bumpkin and didn't know who he was talking to. <laughs> Teresa, tell us a little bit about women activists today and, um, and, and what their activism is, is based around. I mean, we were talking about the vote, and that was such a, to, you know, to us today, that seemed like such a clear thing to be, to be arguing. Well, behalf. I think there are a variety of things that women are activists about uh, today, which is, it it's really goes to tell you the sign of the times. Mm -hmm. Now, what seemed very basic was voting or education. Today, we're having conversations and have activists, activism around health and safety issues, you know, sexual assault on college campuses and issues around rape culture. We have activists around education and quality education and access to education, equal pay and pay equity, issues around child care. I mean, the, the, the breadth of opportunities that women can find their voice in is, is much broader these days than it has been. But you know, you, you mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation today.
today, we're celebrating the 80th birthday of Gloria Steinem. And you know, that, that for me and my generation, uh, just says so much about the need to stay vigilant to the ongoing battles of fighting for equality for women. And you know, from Isabella's time to today, we are still fighting for the greatest levels of equality for women. So if we just looked at equal pay, uh, we would say that women are making 76 to 78 cents to the dollar that a man is making. If you're a woman of color, you're making somewhere between 42 cents and 58 cents to every dollar that a man is making. And so that conversation, uh, means that women have access to the workplace, where we really didn't have as much access uh, back in Isabella's time, but that women's are not women's work and women are not being valued at the same level. And so that ongoing battle from when she started it and having the right to vote, and we believe that once we had the right to vote, we instantly would be able to change uh, the dynamics, just means that we have more battles to fight and we have to stay vigilant to those battles. I don't think that, you know, no social justice movement has happened in a short period of time. I mean, today it happens in a shorter period of time because we have you know, access to the television and the internet and Twitter and all of those kinds of things. We didn't have to write long letters back and forth and wait for them to get to people. But the reality is change takes time. And it takes time to start. You, know, you have to really make change one person at a time. And what I think we don't fully appreciate today is how many actual conversations took place. And the, persistence of those conversations back in Isabella's time to today. Susan mentioned um, Isabella seeing the fact that this had to be passed on, that the, the fight for the right to vote would go from generation to generation, and how she embraced younger women in her older years to, to bring them into the movement and to let them carry on what she had done. Are we seeing that today? Are younger women still coming into the fold as activists? Or is 80-year-old Gloria Steinem still hold, the one holding the flag? Uh, we have young women who are activists every day. They don't necessarily look or act in the same way, but they are absolutely out there. They're using their Twitter accounts and their blogs. They're using their emails and their Facebooks to host conversations, to share information. They are absolutely out there in challenging what they want to do, where they want to be, how they travel by themselves, et cetera. So I believe that activism and feminism is as, as alive today as it's ever been. We just need to look at it in its most creative formats. Although I find young women who say, don't use that word feminism. I don't want to be identified as a feminist. You know, that's true. I, I hear that too. But at the same time, I say to them, what is your definition of feminism? We need to challenge uh, more succinctly and clearly about what people's assumptions are about the words and the language that we use, because I'm not sure we have as much appreciation for language as we did uh, you know, back in Isabella's time. Uh, and so people have assumptions about what that terminology is and assumptions about what that history is. And the reality is it's, it's a really a baseline for full equality for everyone. And I think when you give that definition, people tend to step right up and say, oh, well, maybe I'm a feminist. Just don't label me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we do have time for questions. I hope I'm not ignoring anybody who wants to ask a question. Um, right over here in the corner, but if you'll just wait till we get the microphone over to you, that would be great. Yes, I'm concerned about how the younger generation is going to have obsessions like you have but without letters. I mean, emails and Twitters are not permanent. And writers who are writing about maybe even us <laughs> might have uh, some problems. What, is, what do you think? Is that to me? Yes. People are writing novels on Twitter now. And as much as I want to be that woman on the porch saying, get off my lawn. Technology changes. And, and I think we do ourselves better if we embrace technology as it comes, within reason, within how much time we want to devote to it. But I, I have to echo what Teresa said. I see young women, and I almost want to burst into tears, because the future is in excellent hands, young men and young women. It's just awesome to see how they're taking that message and broadening it. I don't agree with everything that I hear young men and young women say about feminism, but oh well, <laughs> that's theirs. And, and I, I would say that given the broad reach of Twitter and Facebook, Pinterest, you name it, Vine, it's one more way to get the word out. And, and if it's not letters, like I still write letters, okay. As long as it's getting the word out, I'm okay. 
Ron, I think we had a question on this side of the room. Was there someone with their hand up over here? I thought I saw. No? What a shy audience we have today. All right, right over here we have somebody. All the Could questioners you? are sitting in the same row. There must be something about those seats. We came together. I just realized this week, actually, that Theodo Theodate Pope Riddle was also very heavily into mysticism, went to Boston to meet with Henry James and have seances with a very important spiritualist in Boston. I wonder, since the, this seemed to be such a big part of life then, what that evolved to be, what's happened to that, what kind of influence did it have on that generation and any other? There are spiritualist churches in Connecticut. There are at least six, and they still meet, and you, they're open to anyone, and you're welcome to go. They have medium Sundays where you can go, and, and I did this once as well, uh, and talk to a medium. I think the, I mean, maybe I should let you just speak to the history. I'm making this up. From here on out, I'm making this up. <laughs> so just take a nap, and I'll be done soon. Um, my, my notion is you were looking at the Civil War and post-Civil War when everybody lost somebody. And this was a way to cling to their memory and to feel still connected to them. And I think it served a valid purpose. I still think, I'm not a spiritualist, but I still think it serves a valid purpose if it gets someone through the day and they feel they have extra support from beyond. And you make a great point about the Civil War. The um, death toll was so oh, extraordinary, bigger than you know the, uh, the rest of our wars together. So you're right. Every family had lost somebody. Um, and, and that it does make sense that that would really, really develop at that time. Yes, sir, let's just get the microphone to you. I don't need just so He'll just hold it. We need, to pick, we need to pick it up on the, on the TV recording. <laughs> Please let me ask my question. Yes, sir. The Republicans of the past, uh, and it's occurring now and today in the other countries besides the United States, were treated very badly, very tragically sometimes. What was the situation about the suffragettes here in the United States during that period? Durin. Were they treated in the same way? During which period, I'm sorry? The well, take, for instance, the, uh, the, the early part of last century. I, I only know about, in England, they were treated very, very, very badly. badly. Mm -hmm. um, tragically, too. But I don't know anything about the, the activists uh, that uh, were here in those in that period, There's here a, in the United States. The, the movie, is it Angels with Iron? I, I would recommend, do you, if you watch DVDs, there's a, a, a movie called... Iron God Angels. The, the, the story of the suffragette movement and those women being um, imprisoned and being force-fed and, uh, and, and really their fight for uh, what was happening. What, what we tend to forget is that and this happens in other countries too, but women of privilege were in these battles. And when they were in these battles, sometimes they felt a little untouched. As the movement grew and more and more women, quote unquote, of privilege, started coming aligned to make sure that they were um, put in their place, they arrested all of the women. And, uh, and at one point they had uh, chained themselves to the front gates to protest uh, the fact that women didn't have the right to vote. And when they were arrested, they were housed in, in, in awful quarters, and then they were forced fed, and uh, it, was, it was really, really awful. And, and I think you know, the idea of breaking them was very, here? yes, it did. Yes, it did. It's there. It's there. It's in the his, it, is, it is there. But the history book, you know, the other side, if we have to understand, history books are not complete. They are, they are one aspect of history, and we have to, you know, fortunately today we have many avenues of get, getting the data. But I would encourage you to watch, that's just one, you know, one aspect of it. During Women's History Month, like this month, the month of March, there are lots of really wonderful movies that tell, and, and books out, that tell the history of history. We have other questions from the audience? The second row here. Thank you. I'm a, 
always amazed when we learn about people like the, the Beechers. And um, here in Connecticut, we have such amazing opportunities to, um, to learn about them and go to their homes. And, and we walk the same streets that they walked. And, and I'm thinking about the power of place in terms of, of uh, learning. Um, I, I run a program at Capital Community College uh, called the Hartford Heritage Project, and we're very much, uh, you know, in tune with this place-based learning idea. Um, and I know that the Stowe Center does such a great job of taking place, and when people come in there, they not only learn about uh, uh, the Stowe's and the, the Beechers, but they also um, have opportunities to connect it to what's happening today. I wonder if, uh, Shannon, if you could uh, uh, tell us a little something about um, how we're doing with, with young people. Are, are, are schools getting those opportunities? Are young people uh, uh, coming in and connecting uh, with, with uh, those stories? Yeah, I would say that's our um, probably our largest growing audience segment right now, and from our school programs that you know we do for K through 12 as well as college students, um, all of the all of the programs. The goal is to use Stowe's story to inspire um, students um, to create positive change, and we encourage them all to um, identify what is the issue, what is the thing that they care about most, and. And children, whether they're in second grade or 12th grade, um, really have things they care about, that they are deeply passionate about. And that idea that, that they have that power within them is something that sometimes they're not ever asked, you know, to what is it you care about? What, what is the thing that you would like to change? And um, we find that they are very engaged. And we try to um, create programs that give them an opportunity beyond the, um, the one-time field trip to continue with that idea of activism, to give them tools to learn how to express that. Um, with our uh, Salons at Stowe series that we do, we see a, a growing number of college-age students that are attending those um, programs that are activists, um, young women and men that are really committed to their issues and working really hard to um, call attention to them and create positive change. So I would, I'm very encouraged um, by our young generation. And if you haven't visited the Stowe Center um, recently, I really encourage you to do that. It's so much more than an historic home. I think so many people, particularly in other parts of the state who aren't really familiar with Nook Farm and the whole area there, they think, oh, it's a house, you know, it's an old house with old furniture, but there's so much more that goes on at the center that's really very exciting. I think we had a question right over here, Ron. One of the ways that women are marginalized today is attention to physical appearance, and I wondered if that had any historical significance to the Beecher women. Actually, it did, in a weird way, um, because they were Beechers raised by a fairly Calvinistic father. Um, looks were to be not paid a great attention to, and Isabella was cursed with, she was sort of pretty. <laughs> and for the Beechers, that was bad. So that, because, she, I know, this is odd, um, most people want their children to be physically attractive, and she was, and that caused her sisters great concern that she would rely too much on her looks, that she would be frivolous. They write about her being too worried about hair and fashion. She was 14. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what you're supposed to be uh, concerned with at 14, but that, that was their worry that she would go down this path. So that very much was an issue. Yeah. We have just a couple of minutes left. If anybody else has a question they'd like to ask, we'd like to get the microphone to you. Can I just say something that's really cool is that you're here and you're talking about her. She's not dead. That's so cool. That's all. That's all She's I got. with you always. Oh, Susan. God. <laughs> not what I meant. <laughs> well, Teresa, I had a question for you, which is um, who should Susan write about next? Ah, who are Teresa. some of the current female <laughs> activists that we all should know about? Wow. Um, you know, this morning, let me just, let me just give you a, a sampling. I, I can't pick out any one particular name, and here's why. This morning, I sat at a round table with about 30 women, and we talked about higher education and how to encourage more women 
to graduate, to become leaders, to uh, pick careers, uh, to use transferable skill sets, to choose one career and possibly work in other areas. And I looked around that table of about 30 women, and most people don't know their names, but they are impacting their communities on a daily basis, and they are making their communities stronger and better. And what I would say is Susan knows some amazingly wonderful women, um, and the reality is we are not the ones she should write about. The reality is there's a woman sitting someplace in Blue Hills or in Hill House or in one of those areas that will be the next trendsetter and groundbreaker and uh, passion activist that, uh, that we need to hear about. And so I'm going to challenge her to find who that is. <laughs> <laughs> not write a book for men. No, I'm Thank you. Well, I find it's virtually impossible to um, follow Teresa when she's made a comment like that, but I, I can't let that be the closing comment, as important as it is, because it really belongs to you. I just want to thank you all for coming. I'm so serious. My goal was that you should know this woman, and I don't know why, but you should, when I started, I don't know why you should know this woman, but you should all know this woman, and now I know why. And the fact that you're talking about her in the old state house, she just must be having a little party. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all. I want to let everybody know that uh, the book is available in the Old State House gift shop. You can exit through that door and go straight across, and Susan will be here for a little while to be able to sign the book for you. So, um, And the book is hot off the press. I think you just got them, right? So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We look forward to seeing you at future programs.